I want to do a little exercise before we start. I, I'm going to say some things, and I want you to just react viscerally with like, yeah, or, uh, or whatever you sort of feel when I say it. Cupcakes. Yeah. Uh, I like the uh. Thing. Kale. Yeah. God damn you, California. Yeah. Gluten-free. Okay, interesting, very interesting. Not what I would have thought, not what I would have thought. Food trucks. Yeah. Again, way to go, Los Angeles. Bacon kale cupcakes. Yeah. Who cheered? There you go, good. See, I knew, there's always someone in the crowd. So, that kind of gets at the heart of food trends and this gut reaction we have to them, right? I'm sure those of you who said, ugh, to cupcakes, don't dislike the taste of a cupcake. You really have to be screwed up in the head to dislike the taste of a cupcake. It's a little cake. It's sort of the greatest symbol of childhood joy. Um, and the same with, you know, when someone says bacon, it's like, oh, I just want all the bacon to stop. I doubt those people are the people who want bacon to disappear from the menu of diners and sort of cookouts and Denny's everywhere, but they don't want, you know, all the bacon paraphernalia that goes with it. This is the culture of food trends. What is a food trend? That's the question I get asked the most. And it took me a while to sort of figure out what the answer was. That my loose answer is, you know, it is basically an indicator of our collective appetite, where we want to eat, what we want to eat together as a society, as a culture, as a city, as a country, as you know, a time and place in humanity. And it's very interesting that our appetite moves together as a herd. We think that food is something that's so individual, our taste is so individual, that you know, I like cupcakes and you like brownies, but you know, there's never a time when one of them should be cool. And yet, as we look around and we see you know, the way we eat, the, the, the food world, the food scene, the food economy, whether you're into high-end cooking and chefs or whether you're just shopping at you know, your local Albertsons, food trends are really driving a lot of what we do. Um, you have a whole new species of retail places called cupcakeries, which aren't in just Beverly Hills in Los Angeles, but there are cupcakeries in Toledo, Ohio, and Alaska. There are cupcakeries in Asuncion, Paraguay. There are cupcakeries in Lahore, Pakistan, and in Rwanda. These are businesses that are dedicated to serving cupcakes to the people of these places, which is something that never would have existed 10 years ago and may not exist in another five years. They are the edible zeitgeist. So it goes in everything from cupcakeries to you know, the price of pork belly as it relates to the bacon trend, to the diets that we're eating and the way that we're eating, to the way restaurants look, to the chefs that are popular now but may not be popular in a few years, and all the way down to this crazy culture around food trends that isn't even edible. The bacon trend has spawned bacon band-aids, bacon tinfoil, bacon t-shirts, uh, a bacon coffin that you can buy for $3,000, which looks like bacon, isn't actually made of bacon, but you know, for that much money, you can get someone to bury you in bacon. You just shovel in things of bacon um, and then say Kaddish over it. Uh, oh, too soon, too soon. He, he, was, he died so young. Um, to, to a product that this one company that makes bacon A's and a lot of these novelty products make called Bacon Lube. It's a bacon-scented sexual lubricant. No, no, don't worry, there's no actual pork in it, so it's kosher and vegan. But, you know, you'd think, okay, that's pretty funny. They've sold tens of thousands of tubes of this, which means somewhere in this world, there are bacon-conceived babies. Um, this is the culture of food trends. And, and so the question we have to ask ourselves is, all right, well, that's great, but, you know, this happens, so why should I care? Why does it matter? What, what difference does it make in our world? And... To address that, I want to use a very Los Angeles example. I was thinking of doing cupcakes, but you know, today I, I think the city is so rich in its food culture and, and its impact on food trends in the past number of years that I'm going to sort of keep it locally focused. And, and, um, and uh, as Jules alluded to earlier, you know, uh, Roy Choi is going to be speaking as part of a Zocalo event soon, and he's the one who I want to talk about. So put your hands up if you know who Roy Choi is. Right. Just that knowledge is an indication of how pervasive food trends are. If I asked you 20 years ago or 30 years ago who a top chef was or a well-known chef, you know, maybe a few of you who were sort of gourmands would know and the rest of you wouldn't. 
Um, so a, a quick sort of recap, Roy Choi was a chef. He trained in some very good restaurants, but he wasn't on anybody's top list. He wasn't a household name. And in 2008, he'd actually lost his job because of the recession. He was unemployed, he didn't know what to do. And at the same time, there were a lot of catering trucks that were coming up uh, on the market because the construction sites didn't need them. There was a big recession, there was a real estate slump. Nobody was building things and nobody needed to fill the work, feed the workers building those things. And so him and another partner bought a taco truck and they decided sort of around Thanksgiving of 2008 to go and, and make you know, this combination Korean barbecue tacos, this, this, this mishmash, this hybrid of, of two of Los Angeles's great food cultures and foods into one. And it was this incredible success. Um, and, and so the, how that success happened is a really illustrative way of how food trends grow in this day and age. So in, in, in the fall of 2008, uh, Choi and his partners roll out the Kogi barbecue taco truck. And, you know, they use this new medium, Twitter, to announce where it's going to be and at what times. And very shortly, you see that this becomes viral, that people start sharing where it is, sharing their stories of it, waiting in line. They take photos of that, post that to Twitter, send it to other people. And so quickly, without advertising, without a marketing budget, lineups, as long as two hours long, start forming for this thing. Um, and it becomes a phenomenon. It's not just about how good does this taste, but, you know, I have to be there. I was there. I, I you know, I couldn't have gone to Woodstock, but I ate a, uh, a, a Kalbi, I ate a Kalbi talk. 20 years before, even 10 years before, Roy Choi would have rolled out his truck, and maybe a few people in that area would have noticed. And, you know, he would, they said, when are you coming back? And he would have said, well, I'm coming back in a week on Monday. And the next week, maybe there would have been five or six more people in that line. And slowly, slowly, it would have grown over months and, 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 and weeks. Um, and maybe eventually the Los Angeles Times or LA Weekly would have done a story about, you know, new, interesting gourmet truck hits the streets different than your typical lunch era. And another publication might have picked up on that. Maybe a few months later, the New York Times would have done sort of a trend story on it. Um, you know, in Los Angeles, a new way of eating tacos. Uh, and Gourmet Magazine or some other culinary magazine would have done something on that a few months after that. And slowly it would have built and built and built and built. And the following around that truck would have gotten big and you know, Roy Choi would have opened another one and maybe a restaurant, again, over the course of a couple of years. Well, the reason we're talking about food trends here tonight, and the reason why there's such a big crowd, I think, and the reason why food trends are so pervasive is because in the 21st century, food trends don't just grow slowly. They explode onto the scene. Roy Choi went from a nobody to a household name and an American culinary legend in the span of months because people heard about it on Twitter, they shared it on Facebook, they put it on Pinterest, Eater picked it up, Grub Street picked it up, the LA Times blog picked it up, the LA Weekly blog picked it up, it went to Bon Appetit magazine and it went to, you know, the New York Times and it went to all sorts of other things that quickly, you know, there were there were shows about food trucks and, and television programs, and Roy Choi became a celebrity chef in a very short period of time. So how food trends happen now is similar to how they used to happen, but the cycle has been sped up. Everything has been amplified and, and exaggerated. It's, it's food culture on steroids.